Okay, so, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, intimate gathering here. Uh, this is, as you all know, this is the Thomas Lacking dissertation, doctoral dissertation defense. And the uh, title of his work is Technog Technogenic Flourishing A Mixed Methods Inquiry into the Impact of Variable Rewards on Facebook Users' Well Being. And uh, we have here the entire committee. Uh, uh, here on my right is Dr. Bama Chirasi that I think all we all know here at CIS has been with us for many years. He was uh, teaching in different programs, in this was psychology, in integral and psychology, also teaching at Sofia. And uh, would you like to, and you also are an archivist, right? Here yeah, at yeah, I'm also the sort of institute archivist and historian, if you will. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and then uh, here on conference call, can you hear me, Steve? I can very well, thank you. Excellent. Uh, I'm kind of recovering from a very nasty flu, so my, my voice is kind of not as clear or strong as it normally is. So I'm glad you, are, I'm glad you can hear me. <laughs> so um, here on conference call in Invisible Realm, we have like Dr. Steve Whitaker, who is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, would you like to say a few more words about uh, what you do, what's your research interests or areas of expertise, uh, Steve? Sure, yeah. So um, I'm very interested in the relationship between technology and psychology Great. in a couple of ways. So I'm very interested, I guess, like Thomas Lurking, I'm very interested in the effects that um, technology is having on fundamental aspects of our psychology, like our capacity to attend to things, our social relations, uh, our memory. So just trying to understand better how all these te new technologies that are very much part of our everyday lives, how those are directly affecting psychological process. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Steve. And, uh... I'm so glad you are on board because you know where you are our content expert in this dissertation, and then we have also Bama and our kind of method expert. So I kind of relief uh, as a chair <laughs> that I have two experts that can engage this work in ways that perhaps I wouldn't be able to do uh, as a kind of like general director of the orchestra here. So um, thank you both of you for being part of this of this committee. I really appreciate it. Uh, and um, thank you for coming here. Uh, who is here? Like Kelly and uh, like. Um, oh, come on in, Midi. And there's still some of the audience coming in, Steve. So I'm just welcoming them and just also uh, reminding you what I said uh, before in the defense that uh, a dissertation defense is a public event, therefore, it's a participatory event. And uh, of course, this is uh, Thomas kind of uh, um, crossing off an important threshold in his not only professional but personal life, uh, going into becoming a doctor, becoming a scholar in a, a different way. But also, it's important. It's uh, it's important that we we all are kind of here accompanying him crossing this threshold. So we invite uh, your fuller attention, your fuller presence, and supportive presence as we go along. So thank you for, for that in advance. <clears throat> that being said, I'm going to pass the back to, to uh, Thomas. And Thomas, you'll have about 45 minutes to one hour, the most, to present your work. And then, uh, as you know, the committee, the different members will have some time to say a few words about your work, some questions, engage you as a, as a scholar, as a colleague. And then the, uh, we'll have the audience. Uh, it is time to engage you. At that time, uh, I will leave the room with uh, uh, Dr. Shirazi, and then we'll call Steve outside to comment uh, on the presentation, and then we'll come back and we'll deliver our verdict. Excellent. So, Thomas, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, much gratitude and uh, thanks to everybody for, for coming and for all of you who have supported me through this process, certainly my uh, committee foremost, and all of my colleagues uh, as we've journeyed through the years. It's been uh, quite an adventure, and uh, let, let me say a little bit more about my uh, path here. I chose CIS uh, because I wanted to integrate uh, different aspects of my life. I uh, graduated with an undergraduate degree in computer science and worked in the field uh, for some time for 
big companies like Texas Instruments and uh, lastly Microsoft and you know really uh, was privileged and blessed to be part of the uh, dot-com era and had a huge um, impact on my life uh, you know I always say that growing up as a teenager I, I wanted to live in the fast lane so I had an opportunity for a short time but I realized that the, the fast lane isn't uh, always what it's cracked up to be so I kind of started to inquire about some of the deeper experiences and what I would call human problems. So from technology problems to human problems, and that's where I find myself today. And it seemed like CIS was the perfect place to do this integral work and try to pull these two aspects of my life together. And uh, not only on a personal interest level, but I also, as Steve knows, I, um, I work uh, in a clinical um, effort doing uh, counseling as a marriage family therapist and uh, so I was uh, fascinated uh, since day one about how technology can impact the clinical space and you know that relates to a personal question I had was well should I just give up technology and I found out quite quickly wherever I went you know technology is like plumbing you know everybody needs it it's just every, it's just everywhere you go and um, so this is, this is what has led me to this, uh, this dissertation. And I found some really interesting thinkers present perspectives on technology, such as uh, Kevin Kelly, who sees technology as an extension of the senses. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the most powerful force in the world. And all the way back to the wheel, you know, humans and, uh, separate themselves from other species through the technology that they create. And um, all the way to other uh, skeptics even, such as uh, Jerry Mander, who kind of looks at indigenous traditions, who had limited technology and compares it to ours and asks about, do we really find this technology meeting our, our human yearnings for deep satisfaction? Mm -hmm. So looking at the data, you know, it's quite clear the profound impact that technology has on humans. And hence my uh, dissertation path of technogenic flourishing. So technogenic, that's actually a Kevin Kelly word where you take technology, you put ge uh, genesis together, and it's really problems or solutions that come from technology. Um, now a large portion of the human population right now is connected by digital threads that are deeply woven into our lives. You know, imagine we didn't, if we didn't have technology. It's almost unheard of to even ask that question now. Um, the internet itself has transformed the way we communicate and how we process information. I love an analogy that uh, Thomas Friedman brings up. He talks about how uh, the internet has done to humanity what the Gutenberg Press did, except it has done it incredibly faster. It took Gutenberg Press 200 years to really impact the whole of humanity. The internet's done it in 20. So the acceleration is fundamental to technology. And this dissertation is about one of those digital threads that is deeply embedded in the human race, which is Facebook. And this research really seeks to understand this question of technology's impact on human well-being through the lens of Facebook. So one of uh, psych psychological theories of well-being are pretty popular now. They've really been uh, come into the mainstream since positive psychology has emerged. And, um, and the concept of happiness, you know, one of the most popular classes at Harvard now, and everybody's fascinated with that question, how can I be happy? So a lot of theories within po positive psychology have broken this down. They've looked at the history of humanity, philosophers, theologians, psychologists, and said, you know, how, how does uh, the human animal pursue uh, happiness or what the, uh, many are terming now well-being? And uh, it's evolved quite a bit, really, in a short amount of time. Um, one of the elements, the uh, more recent elements of theories of well-being has been positive relationships. And so really, fa throughout this presentation, I'll bring up certain research studies, which are really quite fascinating. Some show that um, there's a 50% drop in the likelihood to die early to a direct correlation between well-being and the amount of friends one, one has uh, in terms of uh, how relationships have an impact on happiness. So this role is really quite undeniable and it kind of makes sense being a technological creature that we leverage technology to uh, 
to bolster our, our friendships. And that's what Facebook does. Uh, so, this is uh, Martin Seligman. He's, this is one of the more popular videos he has on TED. If some of you have used that technology to view uh, these like 20 minute videos on interesting topics. Uh, millions of, of hits on this, and Martin Seligman has used this video to introduce positive psychology and speak about well-being to, to the masses. And um, uh, Seligman says that uh, this branch of positive psychology, the goal is to promote, explore what makes life worth living and building the enabling conditions of a life worth living, which I think is really important to have both of those. It's, it's kind of like one thing for you to have well-being, but what about the institutions that also promote it? So this is also included within well-being. And this dissertation has looked at two uh, primary theories of well-being. One's called authentic happiness theory, and one is called well-being theory. Uh, authentic happiness theory was um, created in part by uh, Dr. Christopher Peterson um, around 2002, and it really kind of builds on three historical elements of happiness theory. One is hedonism, one is desire theory, and one is objective list theory. So the idea is that happiness is uh, multi-dimensional. It comes out of uh, various experiences, and positive psychology says we need to break this down. We need to kind of name these things. So this is um, some of the theory that uh, happiness has, has created. Um, the theories on happiness have developed. So authentic happiness synthesizes three traditions. The pleasant life, which is happiness in hedonism sense. The good life, which is about happiness in desire sense. And uh, the meaningful life, which is also about happiness in a deeper uh, sense, what we would call objective list sense. What are my goals? My goal is to get a, a, a dis dissertation completed. Or you know, these type of things give meaning to our lives. So, you might uh, notice something here, and this is all very logical. You know, we're breaking things down, we're pulling things apart, we're naming it, and that's what technology does. You know, the first thing I learned as a computer science uh, student is that everything is built on ones and zeros. It gets vastly more complicated once you move up the, the layers, but there's a fundamental logic to technology. And um, which is different from the way humans operate. So it's quite fascinating when we try to put these, these uh, two together. So authentic happiness tries to allow what we would call a full life, where we have these multiple components that are all addressed that come together to deliver a full life that satisf satisfies these three criteria. The second is well-being theory, which is a superset of authentic happiness theory. And this is where mainly Seligman came in and kind of said, well, uh, we also need to add relationships and we need to add achievement. So what's, what's the big game on Sunday, right? The, that is huge in America, the Super Bowl, the most watched sports event in our, in our country, maybe even the world, and it's rooted in what? It's rooted in competition and success, okay? So our, our culture pays attention to that and there's a large amount of money spent on the Super Bowl, sports, entertainment. I heard a statistic once that we spend 10 times more amount of money on entertaining ourselves than we do on healthcare. And we spend a lot on healthcare. So uh, it's really quite fascinating that uh, that is now included as one of the elements of well-being theory. So one important thing to, to notice here, the goal of well-being theory is not just to be happy, but to, and they use this new term now, flourish, which is also in the title of my dissertation. So flourishing is the goal not only of well-being theory but of positive psychology in general. Um, the authors argue that flourishing is the epitome of mental health. It is the combination of feeling good and functioning effectively. And this has important clinical uh, ramifications for, for my work as well. So there's a key move here from happiness to flourishing. And Fundamentally, a theory that disproportionately relies on transient mood states such as happiness is not a reliable for, uh, factor for determining uh, a life worth living. Uh, certain authors use examples of like Mother Teresa, you know, who probably didn't have a lot of happiness, you know, and we see this in a lot of her recent writings, but the amount of meaning and purpose in her life was just profound. So 
would we say that she had high well-being and a well-lived life? You know, of course. So that's important to consider. And I think some really valuable uh, models that we can bring to our understanding of, of happiness and well-being. So I tried to take these concepts and apply them to Facebook. <laughs> so everybody knows what Facebook is. Everybody, I'm on the EWP Facebook list. I know you guys are on there. So um, here's some statistics of when, what happens. This is a fascinating picture, by the way. It, an intern at Facebook took this, uh, all the, took a sample of 10 million uh, Facebook friend connections and graphed them. Wow. And so it's similar to what a lot of the NASA pictures are at night when you can see the most developed countries using most electricity. And uh, it's, it's a really fascinating uh, story behind this. And the intern writes, you know, what really struck me, though, was knowing that the lines didn't represent coasts, rivers, or political boundaries, but real human relationships. Mm -hmm. Each line might represent a friendship made while traveling, a family member abroad, or an old college friend pulled away by the various forces of life. So there's something quite deep in terms of what Facebook is delivering to us, right? When you look at it from a, from a mythical standpoint, from an objective standpoint, but of course we need to dig in a little deeper and understand it better. So Facebook, um, so there's, there's the planet Earth and there's Facebook. So the planet Earth's population now is 7.2 billion. Roughly one third of those, almost 2.9 billion, uh, is on the internet. Okay, so it's a large, large, uh, not, not as much as people like Mark Zuckerberg would want, but it's, it's growing. <laughs> now a popular way to use the internet is communication. Okay, so the internet uh, is uh, the fundamental technological tool developed in the 60s by DARPA, which other services run on top of. Inter uh, World Wide Web being one, and email being another. So email right now, according to a 2013 study, says email is used 7.8 hours per week, and Facebook was used 6.8 hours per week. So Facebook is just behind email. You know, it's just amazing how it's caught up so quickly. Now, Facebook, as you know, is a tool that provides a space to share all kinds of information, and you can do it not only with one-on-one, -on -one, but with group. Basically, it's uh, with individuals or, or virtual communities. Uh, so, Facebook's mission, okay, is to get everyone on the globe uh, using its service. And that's why, I don't know if you heard that, uh, uh, Facebook bought a drone company. So the idea is that 85% uh, of the human population lives within access to a cell phone tower, which is basically a 2G connection in developing worlds. And uh, the other 15%, uh, Facebook wants to fly drones over and beam a internet signal in so they too can be uh, on the internet. So uh, really kind of a funny, funny story and interchange between Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg He's like Zuckerberg saying, you know, hey, I want to just get everybody on the internet. And Gates is like, that's crazy. Don't you want to provide health care first? You know, because that's his big move with foundation and planning and everything. And so Zuckerberg says that Gates kind of retracted his statement because of all the research that shows when people on the internet, poverty gets alleviated, education goes up. So there's this big battle of what's more important. Okay. So uh, Facebook's doing pretty well. And if you have a Facebook account, you can count yourself as one of the 1.35 billion people as of December 2014 that use the service. So if Facebook were a country, it would be a little smaller than China. And this, is, this has happened in 10 years, and it's gone from the Harvard dorm room to a campus in Menlo Park with uh, 8,000 employees and thousands of servers hosting your information. Uh, Facebook is the most popular website with more than one trillion page views per month. It counts for 9% of the internet traffic, which is even more than Google. So it's huge. Um, users add 300 million uh, photos per day. And uh, now, when you log, next time you log on to your Facebook account, it may seem innocent enough, right? But think about what's happening behind the scenes. Think about the, amount, the megawatts of electricity that are powering the thousands of servers, 60,000 servers, to serve your online social cravings, to post a picture of your dog. Um, Facebook has invested more than $1 billion in its data center infrastructure, 
And these consume huge amounts of electricity, have been the target of environmentalist campaigns. Um, so next time you log in, just uh, think about the infrastructure that pulls tens of thousands of individual pieces of data to your computer screen in under a second. So it's just phenomenal what this has accomplished, right? Now here's a great quote, I love this, you know, so pay attention at this point. Grossman, <laughs> this, this author, reflected on Facebook phenomenon and how it becomes so embedded in our lives. He says, over the past de decade, humanity hasn't just adopted Facebook, we've fallen on it like starving people who have been waiting for it our entire lives as if it were the last missing piece of our social infrastructure as a species. So Facebook has given us this ability to socialize in rapidly new ways. And through that process of building on this fundamental human desire has created a lot of wealth. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is the 14th richest man in the world and the company is valued at over 200 billion, which is more than Disney, AT&T, and Toyota. This has all happened in the last 10 years. Um, so clearly, something's, something's going on here. And I don't know if you know this, but Mark Zuckerberg was not a uh, computer science major in college. He was a psychology major. So this is really fascinating because really the technology of Facebook, I mean, it, it's, many others have, have been able to duplicate it. There's even open source version of Facebook out there. It's not that big a deal. It's the business execution and it's the psychology behind it, which is so powerful, which uh, is, is really quite fascinating when you think of the human uh, technology uh, interaction. Okay, I'm gonna move, on, move along here. So the problem that I've addressed is the digital technology, Facebook being one, as the psychological drug of the 21st century. The uh, millennials was, was the population for this study. Um, this is part of the birth rate that spiked in the 80s through 2000. And, uh, you know, th there's some challenges within this generation. The American Freshman Survey, which looked at 9 million young adults over the last 47 years, was just written up. And they really spoke of the millennials not in a very favorable light, you know, kind of another me generation. The tendency towards narcissism is up 30%. Um, one uh, author wrote about Facebook, which allows people to control their public image by deleting unfavorable comments. The main fr thrust of these behaviors is distraction. Media and technology allows young people to be false celebrities, the equivalent of lead actors in their own fictionalized stories. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, right? So I wanted to take this reality, this struggle with millennials, this perceived difficulty for this generation, and apply well-being theory and see, uh, see, where we, uh, see what we arrived at. So the result was really some fascinating conclusions that give answers to Facebook, the impact of Facebook on well-being and the challenges that digital media play in promoting narcissism over happiness in this sample of the millennial generation. An important piece is habits. Uh, in the title you see habits and variable rewards and that really speaks to the psychology that Facebook uses to get you hooked and there's certain brain functions that kind of play into these habits and these uh, variable rewards. Um, so a big reason for Facebook's success, of course, is its uh, ability to create habit-forming products. Um, one res researcher uh, reported that the average smartphone <coughs> user checks their phone 150 times a day. Close to 80% of users check their phone within 15 minutes of waking up. And uh, one of the most interesting embodied facts for CIS fans is one third of Americans would rather give up sex than lose their mobile phone. So, you know, there's some serious data out here that really speaks to <laughs> how important or how addicted one might be to these uh, digital devices. And a lot of the neurosciences, now that we've learned more about the brain in the recent decades, uh, point to a reward pathway driven by the neurochemical dopamine. This uh, hef a hefty dose of neurochemicals is leveraged by Facebook and others to draw your attention to your phone multiple times a day. And this process is variable rewards. And this is what Facebook builds upon. So when people are looking for something, they'll check their phone. And same thing with email. You know, some of the interviewees that I looked at for this study said, you know, I kept hitting refresh. You know, it's just 
because you never know when that big text is going to come. You get a beep, an, uh, something happens, and it could be from anyone, anywhere in the world because you know, it's, it's all completely connected. So the role of the dopamine system is to get us out of a state of deprivation. It's a system that helps us seek, want, explore, which is in con con uh, contrary to the opioid system, which, is state, which is, promotes a state of satiation. So what happens when you have these short bursts of information? It just floods different parts of the brain, like the, the nucleus accumbent, with dopamine. And since it's short, it doesn't really satiate much. We just want more. You know, so it's more and more. And look at the uh, success of Twitter, you know, 160 characters, you're done. You know, we're not having conversations, we're, we're just exchanging messages. And it's just this constant addictive habitual pattern that keeps us, um, you know, wanting to go back for more. And it actually taps into our evolutionary development, uh, you know, because if we sat around all day fully satiated as, as cave people, you know, we used to, we'd starve to death. We always have to be seeking, wanting more. So Facebook has tapped into this uh, fundamental human desire for uh, seeking and exploring the world. Um, you know, so that, you know, that is, Facebook is a modern day digital shrine to the power of the human drive for social connection and acceptance. So just a, a, one other quick words on social craving. There's a fascinating book called The Social Brain by Lieberman, and he really kind of emphasizes the value of uh, positive relationships, that element of well-being theory. Um, the, he says that um, to mitigate social pain, humans have evolved uh, sophisticated mechanisms for establishing, establishing their place in the social world. There's a psychological and physiological rush that happens when we have a social encounter on uh, Facebook. And social neuroscience basically says that uh, the human need to connect with others is as or more important than obtaining food or shelter. So we're really at a primal level here with some of, this, some of these new neuroscience findings. Um, and it's really kind of interesting when you think of selfishness. Why are people selfless? And a lot of these neuroscientists are arguing that the social brain suppresses selfish desires so we can effectively operate within a group. And because obviously our, sur our survival depends on it and we can serve the common good. The important people and groups in our lives that help define our sense of identity. And as psychologists, we all know the value of identity, especially when in adolescence and emergent adulthood, which is the population this study looked at. So the social, with such a powerful human drive, it is no wonder that social media has gotten so embedded in modern human life. So really, social media has changed the way people experience <coughs> the world. People will, when they're on a trip or something, they're taking a photo, they're not fully present, you know, a lot of times they're thinking who they're going to share this with on Instagram or, or Facebook, you know. So these are the dangers that we have to watch out. So uh, this is a great little photo, and I heard this uh, on the radio recently, of digital technology. Why do people have their best ideas in the shower now? Because they can't bring their iPhone in. <laughs> right, so it, it gives them the option. You know, it's just it's you know because you don't want to get it wet unless you have the new Kindle Fire, which you can get wet. Uh, so this is a scary thought. You know, We're, how do we disconnect? What do we do for our introspective space? Uh, Jerry Mander kind of is the real skeptic on a lot of this, and he says technology continues to be introduced by people who stand to benefit from it most. And this uh, speaks to the, the global challenge here because there's so much economic reward for this because of the leverage and the volume and the amount of people. So Mander says the public is uninvolved, there are no forums for argument, no referenda. By the time the body politic becomes aware of the problems with technology, it's usually after they are, they are well installed in the system and the effects are too late to reverse. So. It is essential, really, according to Mander and others, that technology really gets implemented with ample critique and analysis. So let's, uh, my research questions were two. This was a mixed methods, methods study. So I looked at how high or low do users of fa Facebook rate themselves in the areas of well-being. 
and then qualitatively describe the experience of using Facebook from the standpoint of its impact on your well-being. And then I looked at uh, relevance. You know, of course, this is uh, relevant uh, in my opinion and my committee's opinion. Um, you know, wherever the fields of psychology and technology intersect. Um, or more specifically, wherever well-being is a concern in a social context where Facebook is used. Um, as we mentioned earlier, one-third of the population, the human population, uses Facebook. Um, there's a rapid growth of digital technology. I spoke earlier of the 85% and the amount of people on the Internet. Uh, millennials are ahead of the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, and their use of digital devices. So we might be sitting a little bit distanced from this, but myself as a clinician, I work with a lot of young adults. It's real, you know, it's real. I mean, I have to ask people, you know, the phone goes out here, you know, and because it's just sometimes impossible for people to just have a conversation for more than a minute without glancing at their, their phone. So um, as the internet reaches more people, Facebook's user base will continue to grow, and I believe that relevance for this study and others like it will become more and more important. This was the flyer I used uh, to, to advertise the study. And uh, yeah, it's a good one. You know, again, you gotta appeal to folks with uh, creativity, cartoons and whatnot. Uh, so, and, and it worked, it was great, you know. One thing that was fascinating though, um, I asked people, some millennials said, you know, I don't really wanna fill out a uh, online survey because most of my time spending is online is doing unproductive things. So they would fill it out with paper and pencil and then we would have to type it in. <laughs> that was just crazy, you know, it's just over the top. But um, anyway, this is second nature to millennials. The world, their worldview is defined by an always on interconnected lifestyle. As a, way, as a result, the way they process information is different from previous generations. Um, the average amount of friends on Facebook is around 200, but if you look at the millennials, 27% uh, have more than 500 friends on Facebook. So, you know, that takes a lot of time to tend all those friends, quote unquote. Um, so I set up a survey, a website, uh, fbsurvey.us, I passed it around and I got uh, maybe 40 to 50 responses, and it filtered, filtered it down to about uh, with an N of 36 was the number of students. The uh, methodology I used, again, was uh, quantitative and qualitative. Um, one of the uh, unique things I did was I created uh, my own study for this, my own survey. And uh, with the uh, generous support of Bauman, I was able to create that, put it together, and it had four parts because I really didn't find any survey that was already done like this. Um, and there were four parts. So first asked about demographics, one asked about how is Facebook used, specifically looking at that, and then I brought in the well-being piece for the last two parts. Well, how does Facebook have an impact on your well-being, and um, what, uh, what, what questions do you have? Or the fourth part was questions about well-being only. The other um, survey was um, Authentic Happiness uh, Inventory, which was created by Peterson, which I mentioned him earlier, and that was a bit different. Each survey was based on the two different um, positive psychological theories, and what happened is we um, correlated uh, both of those surveys because the one I created was not validated, is yet to be validated, and that's something um, could be done, I hope to do in the future, to get this uh, validated to further this uh, field of research. And since the studies were based on two different theories of well-being, there was a different number of questions, um, they were structured slightly differently, I got a, an R value, I used the Pearson product moment correlation of 0.61, and which is, um, it's a good correlation, you know, it's kind of a high, moder moderate to low, strong, and it um, really says that there is definitely a correlation. Most statisticians say anything above 0.5 says there is something there. So I was quite happy with that, you know, and I worked with Bauman on this, and we were able to kind of see that, you know, this survey did target the same kinds of questions that this other validated survey also did from the same field. Uh, 
So, and the qualitative piece uh, with an, it was an N of four there, so I took four people from the quantitative piece with the N of 36 and asked them to go into deeper exploration of their experience of uh, Facebook's impact on their, on their well-being. I picked one uh, person from each category, and I'm going to talk about that um, shortly here. These are the, uh, the four uh, parts that I, that I just spoke with. Um, the first thing dealt with things like education, skill, gender. Uh, there were 26 female, 10 male. Um, I asked about their technological skill. It was, of course, average to high, no, no surprise there. And then two, Facebook use. And part two is the two pivotal questions from which I did my data analysis. One was the amount of time you spent using Facebook, and the other was the amount of um, time you spent creating versus consuming content. That's a really important question that I found from the literature. And then three was Facebook and well-being, kind of like when you send a friend request, does it have an impact on your emotions? You know? So it directly took a feature of Facebook and asked a well-being question. And part four was just well-being in general. In the last week, have you felt happy? You know, yes, no, agree, strong agree, that sort of thing. Um, this is an example of the results, which you soon will be able to see in my dissertation. Um, so I was able to graph it and kind of lay out the percentages. And as you can see here, this is part two of the study, which said how many hours per day. And also uh, the amount of time spent creating uh, Facebook content. These are the two pivotal questions from part two. Um, and then also I, I, I asked about, you know, do, do people, when you create or send Facebook, which of the following features do you, do you uh, use the most? And this is, um, relates to the other element, other uh, perspective I took for analyzing the data. One was through the four time categories, one was through the data as a whole. And so the data as a whole, I looked at um, frequency dispersions, I looked at some other statistics like standard deviations, and then I broke it down for each time category and did some correlating on the content create versus uh, consume. So this is an example of create, send versus view, receive. And that was embedded throughout my whole study, which I also think is kind of unique. I didn't really see anything else out there like that. Uh, part three, um, here's an example of some of the part three questions. Um, now, Facebook part three was really interesting. Um, you know, Facebook has a significant uh, impact on my emotional state and you know it's um, there's some high numbers there for, for neutral I, I question some of the awareness sometimes people had for reasons I'll talk about later um, the bad habits I also addressed that since that was part of my study and as you can see uh, quite a few feel they have some some bad habits which is great you know people are at least acknowledging it one of the, one interesting statistic is that um, you know, bad habits, 65% agree or strongly agree that they have bad habits. And um, more than any other survey in the study, part three most directly inquired the impact on Facebook's well-being. And 69% of the scores fell below the mean, which was really kind of interesting. This, that finding in and of itself could say that Facebook has a negative effect on well-being. And I'll show you that in the previous. Thomas, before you move on, I just wanted to ask a question about the previous one. Is that okay? Uh, um, yeah, is it, is it okay to ask questions now? Or? It's something quick. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, just very, very quickly. I just wanted to see if um, these are the, from this, you've cut these from the same, same part of the study, or is that from two different places? Uh, these are two, this is the same section. So this is part three. As you can see, there's question one, and one that's and question three. 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 Okay. So it's the same yeah. one. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is what I mean by the, the frequency dispersion and below the mean. So you can see in part three, 69% um, are below the mean. And then when you look at part four, the well-being is there's uh, like 50% below the mean. So again, part four is just well-being. Okay, so there's well-being. People are jumping along, having a fairly uh, happy life. Then you throw Facebook in and it goes down. So, and this is pretty common out there. You know, these are the studies. So. Um, I think that almost just validates some of the other studies that uh, we've seen. This again is part of the same section, different questions. Um, table four is about uh, well-being based on um, well-being theory. Again, the AHI was based on authentic happiness theory. This is based on well-being theory. 
And um, that's an example of some of the questions from there. I'm a happy person. Each day is important to reach a goal or milestone. And each of these questions related to one of the five components of well-being theory. Uh, it, authentic happiness theory, this is the Peterson survey. This is set up a little different. My survey at part four, there were 10. Uh, the AHI, there's 24. And you can see uh, an example of the questions there. Select an answer that best uh, reflects your feelings over the past week. Um, these are uh, little pictures speaking to the different ways I approach the data analysis. Those are the five features I looked at, private messages, public, like, friends, and games. And those in general were the ranking of the, the ones that people use the most. Um, I found a huge use is the mobile uh, Facebook uh, messaging app. You know, people use that constantly. They use it as their therapist, emotional support, friend. One person said, you know, 24 hours a day, you know, with 500 friends, I can always find someone online to complain about my boyfriend. And so, wonderful, you know. That's, but again, what kind of exchange is actually happening, you know? So, I know you folks aren't like this, but just be aware, it's out there. So, the, the second uh, picture over here reflects the, uh, the four time categories I looked at. And um, uh, you can see that the second one is the largest. You know, which, as Bauman said, is a finding in itself. You know, one to two hours, we can see that the, the largest amount of people, this is what they use Facebook per day, per day. So that's a lot of screen time. Anytime you use something for that long, it's bound to affect your, your well-being. Um, this is uh, actually the uh, scattergram that, I, that was for that largest uh, category of one to two hours. So I correlated the amount of time people spent creating content versus the amount of well-being, okay? So you'd think that it would go up, and it did go up in all the categories, people through gossip. Um, it's, you know, it supercharges everything, which is what technology tends to do in general. So it can be a really dangerous uh, tool if used in the wrong way. Um, if you want to get a positive message out, it can also be used for that. Again, a lot of times we see efficiency enables quantity at the cost of quality. So that was kind of a good uh, way that I kind of tried to summarize a lot of these, uh, these themes. So what about the value of Facebook today? There's a little chart. Do you think you will quit Facebook over privacy concerns? We see that a lot in the public space right now. Um, a really interesting story one uh, person told me was when people are graduating high school now, they'll change their Facebook name to something funny so their friends can know who they are but employers cannot you know, because they want to protect their, their, their history and they don't want people uh, seeing um, potentially uh, questionable activities they participated in. Bullying, um, rudeness, um, you know, we, we see that even uh, in our professional work of people always having their phone out. The Facebook lifestyle ultimately though despite all this, uh, this data is really alive and well um, because everybody's on it, you know, that's, that's the challenge. It's really a default social platform for a, a generation. Um, and private messages is one of, the, one of the key pieces there. So uh, Facebook ultimately is forming a generation. People don't even ask for phone numbers anymore or email. It's just, are you on Facebook? Done, I'll find you. Um, it's really a requirement to be a player in the adolescent and emergent adulthood generation right now. Uh, conclusions. So, again, the use and the content. 67% of participants reported they used Facebook at least one hour a day. So it's clearly, it's, it's out there, it's being heavily used. Um, some even more, up to 25% greater than three hours per day. I even had, uh, you know, maybe five people in my largest category, which was four or more hours per day. A lot of time. Content creation took up 30% of the time, most likely through private messages. Back to this concept of efficiency, and also because of the primal nature of Facebook, which I spoke about earlier regarding how the brain works and how it motivates people through habits to use this service. I call it primal efficiency. Um, Moravian and Ferris did a, a lot of studies, famous studies in the 60s on how communication works. 
What, uh, how do you communicate? Is the words you're saying important? Is your body language? Is your tone of language, right? So these are the three components that Moravian and Ferris kind of pulled out and kind of let us know that these are really important. And they said over 80 to 90% of communication is nonverbal. But their caveat was this is when you see a conflict between the verbal and the nonverbal. But regardless, it's huge. And you lose all that with Facebook. You lose all that. So that's why these new social cues, they call it text ease or net speak. Um, these, are, these are the kind of the new languages that need to be mastered to be able to uh, operate effectively in this, in this world. So Facebook is a uh, primal platform. It is uh, efficient. The primal brain, just like we see in Maslow's hierarchy of needs and other physiological perspectives on the human person, if you're hungry, you need shelter, these basic needs aren't being met, it's unlikely you're going to achieve high levels of self-esteem. We need to make, and that's what Facebook kind of, in many ways, hijacks the brain just as many uh, drugs do and makes us uh, do things we probably aren't too happy about, hence the, the large number of people in this study who said that they have developed uh, bad habits. Another interesting piece is uh, information overload. A 2009 Stanford study looked at the working memory and what that does when we process information. So it's great that we have Google and Facebook. We have access to more information now than anybody has ever had in human history. But there's a problem with, um, with distraction because it's always it's one beep after the other. It's hard to stay focused on one thing at a time. And the working memory is a key piece of it because it can only store maybe two to three things at, at once. Otherwise, you get overloaded. And then you can't really uh, process any information long enough to get it stored into uh, long-term memory. So the, uh, this, this is a challenge to help our brains not get overwhelmed. And Facebook can be a contributor to that. Um, <laughs> if you look at the evolution of Facebook and how we now even see video ads as you scroll down on your page, I mean, for me, that was like the last straw. I mean, I do not want to see, and they don't just start when you click on them, you, they start when you hover over them. And, and you can't tell which is an ad and which is content from your friends. So you really got to work at it, and if you're not used to being able to s filter and focus and zero in on exactly what you want, you can get overloaded just like that. And finally, deep satisfaction. Um, what about deep satisfaction? Really, well-being, um, superficial versus deep satisfaction. Emotions, you know, 50% agree that Facebook elevates their mood. And that's great, you know, but again, as we learned from well-being theory, happiness is not the only piece. It's probably one of potentially even the least important pieces of the components of well-being theory. So just because it makes you happy, uh, does, that, does that really say enough, you know? I want to argue no, and I think a lot of the positive psychologists would, uh, would do the same. Emotions and relationships are really the big things. Um, over 90% of the participants in this study scored that Facebook is, has a significant impact on their emotions. Um, Facebook helps people avoid lone loneliness through quantity, not quality. And I would argue that if you have 500 <coughs> friends, there's a potential that you're sacrificing quality for quantity because a lot of the Gallup study says the average amount of friends people have over a lifetime is like five to seven. So really, how can you really dive deep into these relationships? It's just something to be, to be careful uh, using this synthetic relational machine. And I'm fascinated with the concept of meaning and, and insight. Uh, meaning requires introspection. It requires you to go deep, to stay with a topic long enough to take a walk in the woods with it and, and not bring your phone with you. The distraction created by multiple streams of Facebook contact is not conducive to promote inner thoughts and leads to insight and meaning in life. I spoke with um, a professor of engineering and he said that, you know, he's just really concerned um, about uh, students these days. And he, he, he went so far as to say his perspective is sometimes students don't even have an original thought of their own anymore because they're so used to getting input from external sources. You know, really, really scary when you don't have your own thoughts, which also connects with um, intuition and creativity. Where is that going to come from? Are we going to have a few people who are managing this technology be in charge of all the new uh, thoughts? 
Media is my drug. Uh, one uh, final study I'll mention, um, this unplugged study, which was, which was huge. It was uh, 24 hours without media, and it in included 1,000 students from 12 universities across 10 countries. And nearly four in five of these students from this study uh, showed significant mental and physical distress when they were forced to unplug for 24 hours, including depression, anxiety attacks, and um, one student said, media is my drug. Without it, I was lost. I'm in a state of constant distraction. I felt so lonely. I was in a small, like I was in a small cage on an island. My phone is my only source of comfort. Uh, so that's troubling. That's troubling, and uh, to say the least. And uh, future research, to, to close on this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of research that needs to be done, and it's just important because despite all the data, the, despite people like me who are raising the red flags and the concerns, um, it's sweeping the human population like something we've never seen before, um, as we've uh, noted through the huge numbers in this, in this study. But there are some really interesting uh, pieces that are coming out of, of research, and I'll just mention a few. One is evaluating technology. Um, this is uh, something I came up with by doing this study. I call it CDC. Being a technology guy, I like acronyms because you can uh, remember them, but then you have to remember what they stand for. And this one I do, fortunately. Um, C is creation, D is distraction, and C is creation, capital creation. Creation is creating versus consuming. You know, so when we introduce a new technology, is this going to help people create content? Is this going to help them? realize certain fulfillment, like imagine writing a dissertation on an IBM Selectric, right? I wouldn't be here today, you know, I'd still be working and fighting with the, uh, the whiteout. So word processors are wonderful, you know, so you could argue that the, that is an excellent tool for creating. Distraction, how is this going to distract me? You know, now that we have Wi-Fi and what about, and a lot of times as Kelly said, we need new technology to solve the problems that the old technology introduced. So where and if we maybe if we ask these questions before we introduce them, you know, look at problems of pornography and gambling, and you know, this is just rampant throughout the internet. Did anybody think of this before we introduced the World Wide Web? You know, maybe not, um, because there's so many forces at play. And finally, creation. You know, uh, these are the larger picture uh, questions that we want to ask. You know, um, how is this product manufactured? Um, were the people who created this technology treated fairly? What are the economic implications of this technology? There's a, a book from MIT called Race Against the Machine, and it shows the economic implications of technology. How can one person create something that 1.35 billion people will use? Clearly, that person's going to get wealthy, even if he only charges one dollar, right? So the volume, the reach that technology has is really important. Um, so this was just an initial formula that I came up with of CDC and I think future research could evolve it and maybe come up with better ways to look at this as we start to implement new technology. Um, user fatigue versus novelty. You know, user fatigue is happening and a study in 2013 shows that a lot of Facebook people are becoming less active. I mean, does anyone like start out has decreased their Facebook use? I saw a lot of people in my studies do that. They're like, I use Facebook like 10 hours a day and now I've reduced it because I knew, realized I was addicted. So people are becoming less active. They're not necessarily signing off, they're just becoming less active. The photo sharing and messaging has fallen by 20%. The fastest growing messaging app last year was Snapchat. It wasn't even Facebook. You know, so things are changing and so user fatigue, combined with novelty, right? So novelty is really a, a fascinating concept. When we see something different out of the norm, our interest spikes. We pay attention. Go back to the dopamine, right? We're always searching, exploring. Again, connect searching new information, connecting with friends with our physical desires. It's a powerful neural wiring that connects to our primal brain. So whenever something's novel, we pay attention. So to hold users' attention, Facebook has to continually produce an element of ongoing novelty. Facebook's not unaware of this, hence the record price that they paid for the, the messaging app WhatsApp, like $19 million or something, billion. 
And um, so finally, you know, to, to close, one interviewee in this study noted that a walk in the woods sometimes is a better choice than going on Facebook. Uh, the walk in the wood do doesn't have the rapid cycling of novel content or the alluring social notifications, but time after time it continues to satisfy. Why is that? Uh, Mander writes, you know, possibly it has to do with the observation that technology perpetuates the cycle of consumption, speed, and superficiality. So maybe technology isn't quite as deeply satisfying as it, as it makes itself out to be. Uh, maybe technology is being oversold in what it can offer the deep human uh, yearnings. It certainly makes life easier and more efficient, and there's clearly a value on that, and there's really uh, no going back at this time. But the idea is to continue to evolve both our understanding of technology and our theories of well-being, so the inter intersection between human and digital technology continue to evolve, <coughs> and we can implement it with wiser choices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for this great presentation. You're welcome. And um, um, Steve, I normally invite um, our uh, external member to go first. Uh, um, and is that okay with you? Uh, would you like to um, comment on the work and maybe ask Thomas a couple of the questions? Yes, that would be great. Thank you. And um, Thomas, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Um, very inspiring and very thought provoking. Thank you very much. Excellent. And the thesis, too, as a read, um, I would say the same things off. So let me just ask you um, uh, a, a couple of uh, questions, quite general questions to start off. So um, if you were to take your research results, um, which are really interesting, as I say, and you were to um, give advice either to millennials or to any users of new media or Facebook, what would you tell them? What two or three things would you tell them on the basis of your own research? Um, things they should watch out for, things they should do, things they shouldn't do. Yeah, uh, great question. I think um, one thing, as I said earlier in presentation, I think these theories of well-being are incredibly valuable. Like I mentioned, they're uh, very popular, one of the most popular classes at Harvard is on happiness. So there's something about this direct engagement with getting to the point, with the content that uh, some of these positive psycholo psychological theories uh, speak to. So I would first say that please understand that just this, this brief moment of happiness, this uh, short adrenaline hit that you might get from a piece of technology is not the be-all and end-all of your well-being. You know, so I think that's incredibly valuable to really get that point across. And so establishing that groundwork using some of these wonderful theories out there and a lot of these books and TED Talks that have written, been written for the masses for the internet generation with short attention spans, um, you know, you can communicate it pretty effectively. You know, second of all, Again, the technology itself, the question is, you know, I would encourage people to ask themselves, are you owning the technology or is the technology owning you? Um, an example is the, the new iPhone, the trend in smartphones is to get bigger screens. And now clothing manufacturers have had to change their design so they can fit these new devices. So it's like our whole world is, being, is revolving around these devices. And so that would probably be a second question I would ask. You know, be careful, try to think through how you're going to use this tool, understand the temporal nature of it, and that would probably be my third thing. You know, what about depth? You know, what about creativity? What about intuition? Um, how is this tool going to um, enhance or limit your ability, especially through uh, distraction? You know, this data is out there, but I think how can we get it across to millennials, especially when you look at the, the statistics on narcissism? How can we get this message across? So I'd say starting with those three concepts of pursuing depth, understanding well-being as a multifaceted component, and asking who's in charge here, you know, the technology or me, and trying to deliver those points in creative ways 
within a, a space in a way that millennials can hear would be the way I would approach it. Yeah, so, but just kind of picking up on the, the, ne on the neuroscience that um, you were just discussing, there's a problem there because of the, um, you're going to have to break an addictive cycle. Right, right. And, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference some of your research in, uh, in this answer, Steve. Um, you know, I think that technology can help, just like I said earlier, we need new technology to solve problems created by old technology. So I think um, some of the apps you created, like Echo, so your most recent research on uh, affective forecasting, and some of the uh, amazing new apps, like uh, I saw one recently called Brain Buddy. You know, here's technology that can help us increase our awareness of how we're being addicted to some of these, this brain hijacking that occurs through these reward pathways, and in many cases, is being caused by other technology. Yeah, I think that so, um, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's been unfortunate. It's also kind of ironic that uh, we're moving to a stage where we're proposing technologies to solve problems with technology. But right. I, I think that, that's definitely a direction. Um, let, me, let me just kind of follow up on that um, with uh, a, a question that you might find a little bizarre, but has its own kind of logic if you follow the trajectory of your talk. So what you seem to be saying is um, Facebook, you know, we, Facebook is a great technology for giving us a rather trivial social fix. And we know that's very addictive, but inherently, most of what people are getting out of Facebook is, is rather shallow in terms of intimacy or relationship building. But could you imagine a technology, maybe not from Facebook, but some other technology, which does some of the things um, relationship-wise that you uh, were saying we can only realize through uh, human interaction? And the re so, so could you imagine having a very deep, I involve discussion over, I know what this technology would look like. If I did, probably I'd be, you know, uh, a very rich person by now. But could we imagine a technology doing some of these things in terms of very deep relationships, uh, discovering uh, meaningful content, uh, experiencing flow? Um, do you think that's a possibility? Because I would have said 10 years ago, if you said to me, that there could be an effective technology for even quite shallow relationship building, I would have said, I'm not sure you could do that, but Facebook's proved me wrong. Yeah. So, are, are there opportunities, you know, this may be bizarre, but could we help these millennials by saying, well, here you can go and be really deep with one another, but it's a new different app. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I it's say... not the direction you want to go in, no, but no. it could happen, right? Yeah, yeah, no. Great question, Steve. Um, there's, there is research that's claimed that the rise of messaging apps is the most explosive technology growth story in recent history. The message app market, as represented in the top seven apps, expanded 148%, you know, adding 900 million users last year. And of course, in my study, the messaging uh, feature was ranked highest. So I think what you're getting at is really important, and it also speaks to the neuroscience and the fundamental human <coughs> yearning for connection. Um, and I would also say, can you build social capital online? And I, you know, I've done it through business relationships, through Skype, um, and I think flow can be achieved online. Um, but I think what you're getting at, it, you know, to use your bizarre reference, is, you know, can we? create these non-verbals, this, this energetic experience of you get when you're in person through technology. I mean, uh, not only did uh, Facebook buy the drone company, they bought the virtual reality company. Yeah. Um, and Microsoft just introduced their Holos uh, virtual reality uh, glasses. Google's got glasses. So I would uh, say what you're hinting at, things will get better than Facebook. I think that potentially is 
you know, the, the next frontier, similar in AI, you know, can humans create is, is always been a, a challenge for computers. Um, we look at self-driving cars, you know, that was just unthinkable 10 years ago, and now it's happening. Um, so, I think, think 10 years from now, we'll be sitting here with our virtual reality lenses on, having a much more a ri richer conversation. Um, Maybe I'll be sitting on some committee uh, using from all over around the world with these, uh, with these tools. Um, it's entirely <coughs> possible. Um, I think there's also always that, that kind of final jump, you know, that kind of the divine to the spirit, uh, to the, uh, the human, the, the sacred, um, to the mundane. You know, how far can we really go? I think there, you know, this is just my opinion, I, I think there is a fundamental point which Technology will never get over the in terms of the human experience of face to face, but I think it will get much better than it is now. Okay, so so, so I, I I agree with you, and I, I think it's kind of unfortunate that we we both think that's going to happen in a way. But let me suggest an alternative and um, see what your reaction is to this. Sure. Is is there some better way that we can sell being unplugged? Mm -hmm. So. Um, you, you know, what seems to be happening here is that, um, you know, maybe through the dopamine rush or, uh, you know, um, intermittent reinforcement schedules, people get very committed to these um, superficial technologies, but can we really show to them, is there some way, which may or may not involve technology, show to them the benefits of that other world, which you know, doesn't involve technology, but involves human relations, or being in nature, or immersion in a project, you know, are, are the ways that we can do those things. So it's a, instead of saying, oh, technology is really bad, can we yeah. say, oh, these alternatives, they're really good. A absolutely, absolutely. And I love the way you opened the question. You said, you know, can we sell it, or we, can we deliver it? I think... Yeah. I think, you know, there's a lot of data out here, and when, when I did this study, I didn't necessarily do it to slam technology, to slam Facebook. You know, I tried to always say from the beginning, I'm trying to be unbiased, I want to be neutral, I just want to get the data and let the data speak. Um, and I think uh, the students that I worked with, uh, primarily at UCSC, were really receptive to that, you know, and I, they loved their phones, and they were really gratified. I mean, some of them even said, just going through the interview itself raised awareness. So I think there's a fundamental uh, principle in human nature of opposition. You know, when you come in and say technology's bad, get rid of it, then you're, it's an unhearable statement. You know, you just can't go beyond that. So I think we have to approach it in a way that is neutral, that's unbiased, that supports it, and then be able to give people these experiences of walking in nature. And I think also, People are already having those, you know, and it's just just the fact that Facebook uses, uh, there's some decline. Uh, the millennials I spoke to really um, said, when you get right down to it, I'd definitely much rather have an in-person conversation. I think people, human nature gets to that place um, eventually. Um, the, the trick is, how do you kind of avoid this addictive cycle, which sometimes has to, they have to go through before they get there. So being able to sell it using, you know, good, solid psychology that's not oppositional and also gives people experiences. And also, um, you know, there's certain professors who have little, you know, uh, buckets. I remember you spoke about this in your classes sometimes. You know, it's just, all right, put your phone here. Or, uh, and, and they can make it kind of fun. I know there's, um, I read stories of people who have parties where it's just like, put your phone here and it makes it kind of this, you know, enjoy the people who's in front of you. You know, yeah. and I think there's a lot of creative ways that we can bring this message um, to people because um, I think honestly, the, the, this message is not something, it's already in them. It just needs to be surfaced in creative ways rather than in, like in a parent mode where you're, you're slamming them for it. Um, sometimes you probably need that, but I think um, ongoing experiences of nature, depth, insight, and deep satisfaction are really the keys to helping people realize there's more to life than uh, quick dopamine rushes. Okay, well that concludes my questions, and I want to just thank you again for, um, uh, for an excellent presentation and, and an excellent piece of work. Thank you.
Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the great questions. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Bama? Yes, sure. Thanks. Sam. Me too. I, you know, really good presentation. <clears throat> And we have we talk mostly about some of the technicalities, and I never really heard the philosophical and the backgrounds. Well, I read read them, but you know, I never really saw you speak about it. So I really have a different idea right now about where you stand actually on on some of these. Um, you know, Tom, I don't really have that many things, but I mean, there's a number of things here. Let's see a couple of things. Might maybe a, a question. Maybe one is a comment mostly. Um, one is, uh, here Facebook represents technology in, in, in this study, you yeah. know. But I'm wondering, you know, if, is, you know, some modification, you know, <coughs> social media technology or something should be added to make this more specific. Because I think technology to me is really, ties back to science and application of science. And it really is a huge area. And even when it comes to computer science and related phenomena in the past 20, 30 years, uh, Facebook seems to me a smaller part of that. Definitely. Yeah. So what do you think about, um, uh, any comments on that? Because I think, you know, there are aspects of, I mean, like, I totally agree with you. Like, I I was the kind of person that 30 years ago had to type my, my thesis, mm -hmm. right? You know, and it's great to have a, you know, there's so many other things that are also great, but then there's this other shadow site that's also coming through. Right. And so basically I'm wondering if um, uh, maybe as a, as a discussion of limitations of the study, you should maybe mention something like this, unless you have something to say about it. Because I think there are some limitations to the study and I wanted to ask her about you mean a of of that. looking at Facebook and then its limits and generalizing it to, just to technology in general. Just to comment to, to make sure that you know not all technology is Facebook and Facebook does not represent all technology. Right. That it may actually represent more of this um, social relationship aspect. Um, sure. More, more of a psychological thing. But then the, the other, and then maybe you can comment on all at the same time. The limitations of age group was you know, millennials, very young. Right. The observations I had was like, they're mostly reporting that they're already really happy, you know. So th it might be that in the future, you know, if you actually study the group of people that don't think they're very happy, mm -hmm. kind of see what comes up, maybe that's another possibility. But this was a very happy group of people. I could just imagine down in Santa Cruz on that nice campus, smoking a lot of dope or something, and they're all basically having a good time, you know? And how objective is, is, is that? That's one thing. Then the gender was mostly female than mm -hmm. male. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, can you address the limitations of your study here a little bit? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Oh, sure. The, the limitations are very real, uh, given the constraints I had on time and access. And um, it, it is, uh, these folks, um, you know, it isn't a Disneyland down at UCSC. It, it's uh, they're, they're stressed no, out. No, no, this, I'll take it back. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve back. might take a fence <laughs> yeah. there, but sorry, uh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a beautiful campus, but uh, you know they're under stress like anybody, and the, it costs a lot of money to go there, and they're trying to get the degree, and so there's plenty of pressure. Um, and they come, you know, they come from challenging families, and they have their psychological issues, but. Um, there's definitely uh, limits, you know, I referenced some of these studies that were huge, you know, the unplugged studies, thousands of people from multiple countries, and so um, there are some, the Global World Index has some of these massive studies. So the number of students, the fact that it was just millennials, that in of itself, definitely limitations. You know, these are, people in college in many ways is a huge privilege, you know, so you could argue this is a privileged population. Um, so there are definite limitations. Um, the piece where you mentioned about Facebook being one element of technology and not necessarily representing technology in general, you know, that's, that's absolutely true. I think um, what I tried to do there, I think the neuroscience was helpful because it was able to take Facebook and really get it un understand how the human relationship with that technology is, can promote the shadow side. And I think that can happen with any technology, only with different mechanisms. You know, so to overcome that limitation of Facebook being one piece of technology, not 
recognizing it as, in general, I tried to dive in there and help us understand the mechanics of why this specific problem. I think there are opportunities to generalize, such as uh, Mander does a bit, you know, he, be, he, he does the same thing. He'll look at specifics for television, for computers, he'll look at solar energy, nuclear, you know, and they all have their different specifics, but there are some common threads. And I think this dissertation study does speak to that to some extent, but in, in many ways, the limitations, it does not. And that's why it's really important to develop a criteria for evaluating technology, which I tried to do a little bit through the study. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. So being aware of all that is, is really great. Yeah. And um, I mean, I do want to ask you, but before we get there, I, I do want to ask you, if you were to continue this study or sure. mind of research or whatever, what would you do? Um, but but um, I'll leave that for last if you want to think about it a okay. little bit. But basically, I, you know, I'm pretty happy with most everything that, that I've seen. But um, I just noticed that, you know, uh, just because I asked you to go back, I want to double check I didn't have the whole dissertation in front of me. Uh, it's interesting, like, pe people are, um, the majority are saying that they have bad habits with Facebook, right? Right. Yeah. And then the majority are saying that it does not impact them emotionally. Right. 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 Like, how can I? How can my bad habits <laughs> not impact me emotionally? Yeah. That's called denial, <laughs> right? Well, so addiction mm -hmm. and denial connection is really important. I think you know you got to lead here, and I think this addiction piece is really yeah. a very interesting thing. And in my own. Just life, I've noticed that being in the presence of other people, you kind of lose your unhappiness and your concerns and things. You just get into that space and it takes you away from, you know, it's so easy to just go on and on and on and indulge in socialization and really not deal with inner processes, you know. And I think Facebook, unless there's a technology or, or process that engages people to then go to their inner world, also does have this this limitation that it's not about the inner world at all, you know. So in terms of connection with inner work and spirituality and, you know, versus socialization, you know, the inner and outer aspect, you know, I think, you know, and addiction and issues. I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I think you've got really something there that... I, I completely agree and uh, that kind of references my uh, point about meaning, which really didn't really fly with the folks, you know. They really could comment on emotions and relationships all day long. But when you start to ask about meaning and even flow <coughs> to some extent, they're like, what are you talking about, you know? So that is uh, a challenge. Um, I'm glad you brought up the point about saying uh, people said they had a lot of bad habits, but at the same time they said it didn't have a big impact on their emotional state. I, I write about this in my conclusion saying, I suspect exactly the same thing you're mentioning. The disconnection. There was a lack of awareness, yeah. you know? And, and I think, uh, you know, going back to Steve's question about what would I say to millennials, be aware, you know? Just, you, know, you might think that, you know, kind of like when you pull up that Facebook page, you think it's pretty harmless, and but there's like 60,000 servers around the world communicating in under a second, pulling megawatts of electricity from, you know, third world countries that can't drink water or whatever they're doing. And just so you can say what's up to your friend, you know, mm -hmm. on this little simple page, it's just like as the you know that old phrase says, you know, it's there things are are not what they seem; they are much more. Yeah. So I, I think that one number I did not take at face value. I dove a little uh, deeper in terms yeah. of exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And I think you could continue to evolve this and say, yeah. well, why is this? Exactly. Why is there this disconnect? These are exactly the kinds of points. I mean, this is you have a lot of data to look at, and, right. and you know you can take your time after this mm -hmm. and, and go back to places like this and then see what you can, where you can take the study <coughs> later. That's why I wanted to ask you last. Right. This is my last question. Okay. Is this your last uh, type of study of this kind or, or do, are you planning to pursue this in some way? Or Well, two things. I, I think the, the study I created, the Facebook Wellbeing Survey, um, and you've encouraged me in this to you know continue to work with that and possibly get it validated. Because I think, um, similar to what Steve's doing in terms of creating research that can be a new technology to solve old technology mental health problems, build into apps, I think survey tools like this that directly address the specifics of the technological problems we're having is needed. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that could be something I would like to do and contribute that to the, the field. And then also this uh, criteria for evaluating technology. I find that kind of fascinating because I think it has the potential to tap into these deeper components of technology that it seems like we're missing. Yeah. You know, when you look at creation in the world and the transcendence and the meaning, it requires a certain level of introspection and it addresses some of the critiques, such as the engineering professor here. So those would be the two things that I would like to continue uh, researching. And, and also, I mean, you know, you did say that the study is not validated, but it doesn't mean it's not valid at all. We have taken, he has taken mm -hmm. steps, and especially the correlation with his part of the happiness with another already validated study leading to a point six one or something right, like that. Six one, right. Point six one correlation means that he's got a, a good ground for looking into this and that's how they validate. They just give multiple instruments to the same group of people and if they correlate highly they say, okay, yeah, if one says so and the other says the same thing then so he's got, you know, a lot of good ground on that. So mm -hmm. so thank you so much. This is all I have to say. Thank you, Bon. Thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. <coughs> Well, thank you, Thomas, for the great presentation. I guess uh, how you speaking before, and I knew it was going to be a really good, 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 good talk, engaging and clear. And so, um, I'm kind of like a, I'm a techno anachronist myself. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I only got a cell phone two years ago. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, a friend of mine in Peru came to my house and sent me to Facebook, and so, so I have, have a Facebook like uh, account for maybe like two or three years, you know. And uh, the thing I've mostly appreciated about it, to be quite frank, is that it reminds me about my friend's birthdays. There you go. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that's what yeah. I find most helpful, actually. That, oh, it's my friend's birthday, now I can say happy birthday, you know, otherwise right. they have because I'm horrible with dates and remember right. those details, you know. So I'm not like a, a user, so I don't have like a, a, a great insider perspective on this world, you know. But, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you like a couple of questions, but before I wanted to uh, just comment on what, uh, again, like uh, as you know, I teach theoretical research, and that's why I was so happy that Bauman was on board and needed, I needed someone like Bauman be on board in this kind of mixed method qualitative research. But uh, what I did appreciate it from my methodological standpoint is is your use and introduction of positive psychology mm. in this work, you know. Some qualitative research has been done without theoretical frameworks necessarily involved, you know, and uh, <clears throat> your use of this kind of theoretical framework, positive psychology, its notions, its concepts, you know, I think it really, uh, I think it was a great choice. It's a great choice, and it's kind of like an obvious choice in a way, well being, positive psychology, but it's a great choice, and I'm not sure how much it has been used, you know, in technology studies, positive psychology, but I think it's a great. Great, great match there, and uh, and I think it's probably a field that uh, guides you in the elaboration of this uh, Facebook well-being survey. You know that uh, that I hope that you get validated further. You know, and maybe you can sell it to Mark. Mm -hmm. to yeah, to, yeah. No, seriously, I mean, yeah. why why wouldn't he? I mean, that's an interesting question. Why wouldn't he be interested in in learning? You know, like. What his being a psychology being. student himself, it's, it's, it's yeah. like the well-being too. I mean, I'm sure he wants. He would think I would using it like, oh, I'm gonna use this you know, to promote Facebook. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's a Trojan horse. Maybe it's something that he would. I don't know. But, but could be interesting. I, I wonder if, if within Facebook is they're thinking about measuring these things. You know, and if not, why not? I mm -hmm. mean, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's because it's not his first motivation, but um, I think it would be interesting conversation to try to engage them, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think you're the man for the job. <laughs> yeah, that's great, great, uh, great point, great point, yeah. I haven't seen it, like, that's why I did the study, I haven't seen it done before. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure he would love to have like a validated psychometric survey called Facebook Wellbeing Survey. Mm -hmm. I think Mark would love that. Be a psychologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I encourage you to, to approach them or to approach Mark if that's something that resonates and you think would be yeah, yeah. interesting. It can open something interesting doors 
for you, but also for them and for Facebook mm -hmm. themselves as a, as a point of self reflection of the impact of their technology on users. Right, right. I mean, right. It, uh, anyway, I can go on and on in that direction, but uh, I think you get the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> drill. Yeah, that's a fascinating uh, thought, yeah. <coughs> Great. So I have two questions, one more concrete and one more more uh, ample. Uh, uh, the concrete one was like, uh, I was just curious, uh, what, what was the most surprising finding for you mm -hmm. uh, in this research? What's, it, was there anything that really, wow, raise your eyebrows, you know? And if so, what? That could be it. Um, yeah, I think it was uh, the. I, I guess I want to say um, honesty in some ways that the uh, students had. I mean, I, I kind of expected. Um, I, I, I expected denial and uh, immersion in the technology and almost uh, potentially threats from being questioned about it. And, and I think um, uh -huh. so. So I'll, I'll say two things. You know that the fact that people even brought up nature and said, you know, sometimes I should go for a walk. And I was like, oh wow, that's really interesting. I didn't think that would come. Up. But on the other side of the spectrum, there was one person in the qualitative side who just was a complete fan of Facebook to to the point where, and this was someone who was. A, very interested in uh, dating and getting married, okay? Uh -huh. So this person was pursuing romance and relationships, and she had, it, it was like her therapist, you know? And, and, and she was the one who told me that quote I mentioned earlier, that uh, at any time of the day, with all the friends I have on Facebook, I can always find somebody. And if someone like that, you just can't, you have to tread lightly, because you can't threaten her, her therapist. Yes. Right, and so that that was a little shocking because you know you do this research, you read the studies, you figure well everybody's got to be somewhat skeptical about this technology, yes. but to find somebody who's completely bought into it, so I'd say those both sides of the spectrum were uh, a bit shocking and surprising. That's great, and I'm glad you wrote that up about uh, the person who's looking for romance. Because yeah. It started, yeah. Facebook started out as a dating service. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. But you know, this is not yeah. really discussed in this study because your focus was different. Uh, but I've always wondered, like, um, I mean, I suspect uh, that a, a lot of, one of a, a kind of like hidden or motivation factor in like this of Facebook is because people are looking for connections and potential. Yeah. Sometimes very often don't want the connections, you know, like uh, getting friends and requests, like who is, who is approaching me? <laughs> right, right. So approaching me is someone that kind of have like a meaningful relationship with, you know, yeah. perhaps or not, you know. So um, anyway, that, that's great. Uh, the, the kind of deeper or um, wider question is like a more an open, but also deeper question, I think. Uh, it's, uh, um, you know, like uh, following up on Bama, and Bama already brought here like kind of the of spirituality and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, in your talk, in your you know, we have heard the word narcissism, uh, the word emptiness mm -hmm. came up several times, you know. Um, you talk about deep satisfaction, deep satisfaction versus just <coughs> well-being, and, uh, and deep satisfaction, I think, is has something closer to what, uh, you know, in like a spiritual literature would, would call kind of a spiritual fulfillment, you know, or like something different, you know. So I'm wondering, like, um, how would you, um, if you were going to articulate uh, a spiritually informed um, assessment or critique of Facebook, what, what would, how would you do it? What, because uh, I know that there has been some, some books you know, that have explored a little that, right. you know, but I haven't seen, maybe because I'm not familiar with the literature as you are, maybe you can tell me, that it's like a, a whole, you know, from a spiritual perspective, you know, like, what's, what's the problem there? Uh, yeah, we, yeah. We put that lenses there, you know. And I know you know you, in addition to being a scholar and a, a techno expert, yeah. you know you you're a practitioner, you know. Yeah. Uh, from a tradition, you know. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering also from that perspective, what what do you have to say? Yeah, I had a student colleague in my master's psychology program who wrote a book called The Church of Facebook. The Search. The Church. The Church of Facebook. The Church of Facebook. And um, another uh, in, in my church, I go to. Um, People, the term is really interesting terms. They said uh, our physical neighborhoods now are now be calling, are, we're now calling strangerhoods. 
things, you know. And the virtual world is where we have our real neighborhoods. Oh, wow. So, you know, and I, I like to um, differentiate, like when you look at spirituality, we have religious institutions, mm -hmm. which, you know, the Vatican and organizations that are physical structures and rules and regulations that tell you not to eat meat on Fridays and stuff. But then you have the sacred, the, the mystical, the, the depth experience, the alchemical, you know, of what it's like to really have a spiritually transcendent, fulfilled experience. And those can be quite different, quite different. And I think Facebook, you know, serves the institutional and the communal really well, you know, and, and, that, and that's great, you know, to a point, obviously. Um, a lot of churches have uh, Facebook um, uh, accounts. I know churches that take out Facebook ads to say, hey, we have an Easter service coming up. But I think it just really needs to have a very clear line between this isn't where you're going to get your spiritual experience here. And a lot of the research, such as um, Turkle, MIT, um, really talks about Facebook is most effective when it's used to point to something else, uh -huh. you know, like a sign. It's like we don't complete and fulfill our relationship here in this virtual community. We say, let's sit together Wednesday at 5 o'clock and have our prayer service, right? And then you go and have that experience. Facebook facil facilitates, back to the word I love, efficient communication, mm -hmm. which is great, you know, because that frees you up. Mander even would argue that, not so great. But there it is. We communicate, we have these opportunities, we have a lot happening, but it can't end there. Mm -hmm. Facebook, you know, that old phrase is, you really can't have it be an end in and of itself. It should be like a means to an end. And I think that applies more than ever in the domain of spirituality. Uh -huh. That's great. So it would be like a, kind of a blind spot or a spiritual blind spot that a, a mistake that can happen, right? Take oh, it, on, yeah, on, if people on, use it for an end. Versus just something for connection, further connection. Yeah, I mean, people, we have the phrase around here, spiritual bypassing. Uh -huh. You know, you could argue that that's a form of it. You know, to yeah. say, you know, you're bypassing the real experience by ending it on Facebook in yes. a virtual community. Yes, yes. Thank you. So, you're that's welcome. Great. You're welcome. Wonderful. Um, before we open uh, questions and engagement from the audience, I don't have more questions. Okay. I think the work is really great. And, uh, I hope to see the, the survey validated and Max yeah, that's right. money buying into it. And I can just decide <laughs> what to charge. <laughs> and you became very uh, famous. Oh, I will. <laughs> uh, and you became very famous and, and then remembering us. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's one day we say that. One, uh, Maybe one step of how you use informed consent. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. But uh, before we open into the audience and, uh, and we go outside, uh, you know, Steve will go outside, uh, I will we'll call you on the phone. Uh, Outside Baba and I to talk, and then we'll come back. But uh, before we do that, uh, does either of you, like uh, Steve for Baba, have any other question or anything that came up in the conversation uh, after you talk that you wanted to, uh, to to say or to ask or to come back to? No, I, I would say just in terms of talking to Mark Zuckerberg, I, I think Facebook, from my connections with them, they are very interested in these types of issues. Mm -hmm. They definitely are. Excellent. But that's that's not uh, that's not wishful thinking. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. No. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Excellent. Yeah. It's not out of the question. Uh, I excellent. And uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm very happy to hear that. I'm very happy to hear that. And uh, not totally surprised um, from what I know, but very happy to hear that. And uh, and yes, uh, it's like why not? Why, the why they shouldn't be interested? You know. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, I wonder if they already have some kind of initiative, internal initiative, to to assess those questions about the well-being in their users. Do are you aware, Steve, of any initiative uh, inside yeah. Facebook? Yeah, so, so, so they they are they're uh, interested in measuring that. They're interested in measuring um, the quality of relationships that result from um, Facebook interaction. So that these these are things that are being actively explored in their internal lab. Excellent. So uh, it sounds likely that they may be interested in using a validated psychometric measure called the Facebook Wellbeing Survey. Seems natural. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Excellentness. Wonderful. So, um, um, Steve, can I can I have your telephone number? Okay. Yeah. So my number here is eight three one. Eight three one. Four five nine. 
2390. So we're going to uh, disconnect you from the conference call and I will call you from outside uh, in a couple of minutes, okay? Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then I invite you, please, uh, it's all yours, for a few minutes. Uh, uh, good luck. Oh, nice really nice to. Nice to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so now come the hard questions. <laughs> yeah, in the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, congratulations, Thomas. Um, really, I'm really excited to, to witness, you know, uh, the end result, the pr product of your hard labor. You were there. I was there from the beginning. beginning. Yeah. So hard, hard that's why I was so. Yeah into this presentation because I could see how you were forming the first ideas into something that kind of makes sense and when I see that like this I'm like wow I would have never guessed just a year ago yeah. when we were struggling in our meetings. Anyway so that's good um, and I'm really really uh, enjoy your topic because when I wake up this morning I couldn't find my phone, I couldn't find my computer, I thought my world has collapsed. Right. So for about 30 minutes, I was just staring at the ceiling, the walls, I'm like, I'm lost, I'm disconnected, I don't know what is happening. Right. So what you're talking about is real, like it's not really like an academic uh, exercise, it's really real life stuff. Yeah. Um, that's why I think this work, uh, sure belongs to here, but belongs to a uh, high, uh, higher uh, areas, and like, well, you understand what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. So. Um, to come back now to the the, the, uh, the, the work itself, I was, I was going to ask you a question about your methodology, but I think uh, Bob already answered that in terms of how uh, you want to validate your survey and uh, what would be the steps that right, you would take right. to, yeah, to, because I think it's a, 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 um, it would be a powerful survey, just like you encouraged me in my model, so I think that would be a really powerful survey and also I don't know, it would take you a lot of time and maybe money and all of that, maybe you can explore if Mark or those institutions can finance, you know, like some kind of grant to further... Yeah, like great idea. That. Yeah, 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 no, great, great idea. So, when you talked about um, that everybody, everyone is on Facebook, you know, but Facebook has plateaued, you know, less active because of novelty one-off, um, I had a question about that. Um, what is what is the impact of using Facebook on a daily basis, like many hours at a time, on the brain? I'm not talking about a dopamine or whatever. What I'm talking is about uh, the brain fatigue itself. Like, mm. are are there like side effects of really staying? On the screen on Facebook all day long and, and, and socializing. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think I heard that. Yeah, I mean, I didn't go into that too much here, but I think you start to get into areas of ADD, ADHD, you know, the inability to focus, concentrate, stay connected with one topic at a time because that's the nature of the environment, you know, where you have beeps and, and fun and information. And I talked a little bit about the working memory and it can only hold so much. And you start to get habituated into only getting short little pieces of information. I mean, we're already there when you look at the TV news yeah. soundbite. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's it's here, and then it's over time. You just find that you just meet certain people, and there's just zero depth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, do you ever have like some really deep, thoughtful yeah. idea about a, a concept anymore? And I think that's the danger of what you just mentioned. And especially on a developing brain, on younger people, a lot of the research says that is, even Steve Jobs limits access to, or used to, limit access to all the Apple products for his kids. Mm -hmm. Because the developing brain doesn't have that ability to differentiate between virtual and real yeah. as much. And they just get drawn into this world because it's so much more appealing. So my last question is, you mentioned that we're moving into an AI's area. Right. So does that mean it's a death of the soul? If so, how do we... Um, mediate that? How do we work to, 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 to save the soul there? Yeah, well I think things like these criteria is going to be more and more important and studies like this is going to be more and more important and 
you know, what we're talking about here, about bringing this to uh, Zuckerberg and people, tech leaders who have a sensitivity for these kind of issues, and I think he does, um, is going to be just even more critical. Um, that's an interesting phrase you use, the death of the soul. I mean, AI has been around for quite some time right now, and it, uh, has, it serves um, a lot of really wonderful tasks from space exploration to some of the appliances into the Internet of Things, which is coming. I mean, it's coming, you know. This stuff is just going to start to take over yeah. more and more from driving our cars to cooking our dinner. And how do we get soul? How do we not lose the alchemical, the soul, the intuitive, you know? And that's going to require an even more burden upon the spiritual dimensions of life, the institutional spiritual dimensions of life, to bring us into the sacred. So I think there's, the technology is going to require more and more from our spiritual institutions, graduates of CIS, to recognize and remind people that don't just follow this technology blindly. We've got to have depth or else we're not going to be human. We're just going to be AI units walking around. <laughs> And we don't want that. <coughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you for engaging uh, Thomas and uh, um, Steve. Is, Steve, can you hear us? I can. Yes, okay, very good. So, well, basically, uh, the committee anonymously is, is very happy with the work and uh, we believe it's a genuine contribution, uh, academic and social, and a very timely, timely question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously, that is very. Yeah. But more important, we think the promise and the, the power and the hope for this work to develop it further, so we encourage you to develop it further in many ways, I think with the collaboration of Facebook, you know. All right, there uh, you go. Mark, I mean, seriously. Use so, the technology. Uh, we'll be approving uh, the dissertation uh, with, some, with some minor, uh, you know, style mm -hmm. things and, uh, and um, uh, you know, the consideration that Bama brought about limitations, maybe asking you to to read the limitation sections and see if there's anything you can add there. Okay. So we'll be approved with minor uh, changes as most dissertations are approved. But mostly I uh, want to congratulate you, Dr. Thomas Lucky. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Thomas. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you for all your support. It's been a, a long journey and uh, this is a great way to conclude the process, to be able to have a gathering yes. like this and interesting suggestions and perspectives on continuing the work. So yes. thank you so much, and uh, I'm grateful for everything. Thank you. And Thomas, before we let you with your fans here, uh, if you want to say goodbye to Steve, and then we'll do the form signing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Steve, for, for all your support and your last-minute form signing. And I'll be, I'll be in touch more, Steve, about your research and uh, the follow-up on mine. Thank you so much, Steve. It has been a pleasure you. working with you. It's been a very enjoyable and interesting process. Thank you very much, but thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank All you. right. Bye-bye. So, um,